Australia. So first of all, I'd like to welcome you to the session. We'll go ahead and call it a start at this point. And today what we will be talking about is how to buy HR technology. So my name is Bob Saint-Jacques. I will be moderating this session, this breakout session for you. And I'm pretty excited because I've got two amazing people um, and we've already spoken before this and I was just so, you, you know, pretty much, uh, I totally geeked out asking them like a million questions on how to do things and, and preparing for this. And I've been doing, I've done 27 HR tech implementations, but then, you know, talking to them, I was like, ooh, okay. I could have used their help so many times before this. So I think, uh, you know, the, the folks here who are listening are going to get a lot out of this. Like I said, I've done it 27 times. I did get a lot out of it um, and, and talking to them in preparation for this session. So in terms of my background, yeah, I started life as a labor and employment lawyer, uh, then went into HR and where I've done predominantly HR transformations using technology. So, you know, one of those things I've implemented Oracle, number of times, SAP, Bamboo HR, five different ATS systems and so on and so forth, created career websites, uh, everything from Rod B to o &A analysis to intranets and so on. So I'm pretty, you know, like I said, even though I'm fairly experienced in this area, I just thought, you know, just talking with, with uh, you know, Phil and Yvette, which just, you know, blew my mind in terms of the things I should have done uh, before, but now you will gain the, the benefit from their experience. So what I'll do is I'll go ahead and allow them to introduce themselves and let them talk to you uh, a little bit about their story. And I think that's really important in terms of how they got where they are. So that's what I found fascinating in, in preparing for this, was speaking to both of them and saying, hey, how did you, you, know, you come to be where you are today? And it's fascinating. So putting you on the spot, but I know you can do it because you told me all about it. Uh, let's start with Yvette. Tell us all about yourself. Tell us your story. Sure. So I've been in the HCM space for uh, over 25 years. I stopped counting at 25. Um, and I've spent most of my time in HR technology, working with software vendors and product strategy and product management. And uh, actually before that, I had 12 years as an HR practitioner. Uh, in the last uh, seven, eight years, I moved over to the consulting side. I was an analyst at Gartner and Constellation Research, where I had the opportunity to talk to literally thousands of organizations who were evaluating software, implementing software, um, conducting, you know, uh, magic quadrants and other kinds of uh, analysis of software. Um, so I had a really, really great uh, experience from both a practitioner and a vendor side to move me into the analyst side. Um, and so now I am doing work um, in my organization, NextGen Insight, um, advising uh, technology companies and buyers on, on software selection and strategy and direction. Um, most recently, I've also uh, founded a, an industry consortium uh, around some NextGen uh, capabilities around uh, personal profiles. And that's all, you know, a genesis of looking at what's happening in the market, the trends, and really where we need to take things. So I'm really excited to be talking to organizations here on this session about how to buy software, because it's not just about feature functionality. It's about ensuring business agility, thinking to the future, and um, making sure that you're setting your company on the right path. So super excited to share my, my experience with uh, folks today. All right. Thank you, Yvette. Over to you, Phil. Yeah, thanks guys. Um, thanks everybody for joining. I'm super excited to see what happens in this chat over here. Uh, so my name is Phil Strzula. I started my career off doing early stage software investing at Bessemer Venture Partners, doing you know venture capital investing. Um, went and got my MBA and I always wanted to start a company. And so I taught myself how to program, um, started an HR tech vendor, which is essentially a recruitment marketing for SMB type company, helping companies with their player branding, top funnel recruiting, stuff like that. Um, about a year and a half ago, I hired somebody to run that company. And so I had all this spare time. I have the startup bug. And so I wanted to start another business. Um, I find that it's really hard to understand these landscapes. There are hundreds of vendors. I went on Capterra, which is sort of this like Yelp for software a few weeks ago, and they have 200 ATSs that are listed four stars and above. Um, and so I was like, ah, oh, that's, that's not super helpful. Um, so basically what I do is I just spend all day talking to people who 
um, actually like work in the trenches, um, people who are more like at the leadership level, people who are running these companies, et cetera, and just understand like, okay, what, what are the best ATSs? Like if you're going to buy a new ATS, what's your short list? What are the seven ones you actually want to spend time on? What's going on with AI in recruiting? Like is AI going to steal our jobs? Is it something we can actually implement? Is it just marketing speak, et cetera? And I write all that stuff up on my website, select software reviews, um, for anybody's consumption. Oh, Bob, we lost your video, uh, your audio. Sorry, I was trying to make sure we didn't get feedback. There we go, back on. Uh, so thank you for, for those introductions. So what I wanna do now is go over a little bit of the roadmap of what we'll be talking about today. So basically, you know, uh, time allowing, and we did get through it in the last session uh, that I moderated, you know, a few hours ago, but we will have five topic areas uh, that we'll be discussing. So in terms of, you know, when the process of buying software and, and you know, how to buy it, right? So typically, and I'll, we, I will open myself up and tell you tales of woe in terms of, you know, what I could have, should have, would have done better had I known certain things. So we start, you know, we'll start with, um, you know, how to identify, you know, the, the problem in terms of, you know, a lot of times you just jump to the solution, but how do we identify the problem? The second area we're going to go into is the discovery and planning phase, what that looks like. Um, another one, the third area we're going to look at is business cases, pitch decks. Um, and the fourth topic area, we're going to look at the information we really need from vendors and, and, and you know, how we go about getting that information, uh, you know, answering the questions and I'll throw it to the panelists, right? Are references necessary or, or even effective? And then the last piece, you know, in terms of summing up, because it, this is hacking HR, uh, we, I will put the, you know, our two panelists on the spot and say, okay, what are your top two or three hacks um, that you would advise and um, so that you folks can walk away and either this afternoon or tomorrow, boom, you know, you've got some great pieces of advice and you're able to action this. So in terms of the first topic, right? So, you know, imagine this, uh, you know, I'm fairly young, new to HR, I'm really excited, I wanna make my mark, and CEO comes to me and says, hey, I just got back from wherever, and, and I read that in this airline magazine, and there's this thing called an engagement survey, and we need to have an engagement survey, and you need to do this next week, and, and I heard Gallup was the best, so go ahead and call them up, get the survey in here. So I was like, oh, cool, I'm excited, right? I got buy-in from the C-suite, let's just go. This is, you know, I'm gonna be a superstar, I'm gonna make my mark, this is gonna be awesome. And I know all of you are like smiling, shaking your head going, <sighs> right? So, you know, therein lies the problem. Sometimes you have, you know, C-level excitement, you, of course, wanna help. Um, nobody ever got fired for bringing in an employee engagement survey, but the question is, is why? Why were we bringing that in? What problem were we solving? What outcomes did we want? So in my excitement, I went through, and then, you know, of course, when you call up, you get the invoice. <laughs> you know, it's a little bit of a sticker shock, uh, so to speak, in terms of what happens, right? So then you tend to expand, and then this product, this project starts, you know, going crazy because I had not pushed back and or identified what problems we were solving. So to avoid, you know, the lessons I had to learn over 20 years the hard way, because I'm a little thick, um, I'm going to hand it over now to our, our two panelists who can tell us how do you, number one, identify the problems that you're trying to solve in the first place? And secondly, you know, how, how do you push back against some very well-meaning C-suite and leaders who just want to get to the solution, right? And how do you balance that as, as an HR practitioner? So there you go. Let's hear from the experts now. Yvette, you want to go for it first? No, or? I was going to let you go first. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, sure. So I, I think like first and foremost, like what you're describing is like shiny object syndrome, which I unfortunately suffer from as, you know, a sort of ADD entrepreneur and, I think any good leader in organization has to help coach, coach upwards, coach, coach vertically, whatever the, the people in your organization. Um, and so like, honestly, like in, in this situation, I would 
probably like try to figure out like, hey, like what are some strategies where we don't start chasing random stuff across the entire organization? Because you're probably saying stuff like this to the VP of sales and the head of marketing and, and everybody else. Um, second of all, yeah, it, it's, it's always like, when we are thinking about something seriously, uh, we're gonna spend a lot of time, we're gonna spend a lot of uh, money on a given initiative and it has to be grounded in reality. Um, and for me, reality always means the business case, which I think we're gonna talk about in a little bit more depth down the line. But um, my you know, sort of like MBA brain always goes back to how does this impact the PL of the business? Um, and even something like an employee engagement tool where you might say, well, you know, it's really hard. It's going to like increase our culture. And like, so therefore, how are we actually going to like make this show up in a way that the CFO appreciates? And my pushback on that would be almost anything that you do can be modeled out in a way that affects the PL. Um, you know, employee engagement, it, it might be like, okay, like, this is going to change the sort of like lifetime value of an employee by increasing retention um, and potentially like increasing productivity or something like that, right? And so in this, when you're having that conversation with this fired up executive, it's, does that matter to us? Do we have a problem there? What are the other problems in our organization that we should be tackling? Um, and within the sort of core frameworks of how we think about the stuff that we should be focusing on, does this rise to the top, not just, hey, I saw this thing, I'm super excited about it, let's go do it, um, and here's the vendor, even though I've done no research, that in a rational way doesn't make any sense. And, and I think that you just gotta have that like hard conversation and then go back to the frameworks that you're hopefully using to evaluate all of the initiatives that you're sort of bubbling to the top of your priority list. Yeah, you know, uh, Bob, I'm gonna push back a little bit on your comment that, well, nobody got fired, ever got fired for implementing an engagement survey. Um, I can't say specifically they have, but they certainly can put themselves at risk because one of the things I found in that particular example of employee surveys um, is that, yeah, you can you can put the tool in place, but in research that I've done, um, I found that in more than 50% of the cases, organizations aren't taking action on the feedback that they get. And the worst thing you can do is ask people for their opinion and then ignore it <laughs> because you talk about a cultural demotivation that's it's huge so i mean that's just one example we're chasing that shiny object and implementing it thinking oh it's going to change a culture etc if you don't have the plans the strategy the infrastructure the support to follow up uh, to measure the right activities, um, to align it to business results and outcomes, uh, you actually could be doing much more harm to the organization than good. Um, so when I'm talking to organizations and, and they're evaluating, oh, you know, gosh, we need to um, upgrade our software, we need to invest in this area, um, I always caution them to, to come back and think about the employee journey and to really focus on those moments that matter, right? Where are those major um, friction points? Where are the major points of opportunity? And how do they align to the overall challenges in the organization? If you're going to make an investment, um, ostensibly you're doing it to improve the business, right? To improve profitability, customer success, um, the you know your speed to market, the company's agility, whatever those business needs are, you have to evaluate um, your processes and the supporting technology in light of those business objectives. And, um, and when you're evaluating your processes and technologies, you have to engage the employees in that process. You have to be surveying and talking to and, and meeting with the individual constituents um, across the board to make sure, again, you're getting a full understanding of what the problem really is. Um, I had a situation where uh, at one organization, they thought that their problem was that they needed performance management tools. They, they were looking for a better way, they thought, to improve the communication between the employee and the manager so that they could drive better training and productivity. Um, after they uh, started engaging a broad set of employees in kind of this design thinking concept, they actually found out after the fact that it wasn't a, a performance management tool that they needed. They actually needed a team collaboration tool, a tool that fostered better communication, insight into who was doing 
what feedback on those projects. It wasn't simply a manager employee performance tool at all, but the HR person to start was so sure that that's what was needed and their vendor was offering some cool new tools and without that, that complete engagement and really discussing with employees those moments that matter, they wouldn't have found out what the, what the challenge was. So identifying the problem is key and um, aligning it with the business, uh, the business needs are, are critical. All right, thanks for that. Just to, to drill in a little bit deeper, Yvette, and in terms of your comments, so when you talk about you know pulling the data and, and talking to the stakeholders and, and really trying to dig a little bit deeper, right? Because you have a surface issue, you, you know, it's it's the the proverbial obvious, right? Hey, we'll do an engagement survey. Everybody will be happy. Everybody else is doing it, um, literally, because you know companies are spending eight billion dollars a year on engagement surveys. So somebody's doing it. Um, and so they're not all yeah. getting fired for it either. So that's good. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, if I go with the herd, yeah, yeah, it's, it's fine. So in terms of, you know, your experience digging a little bit deeper, right? How, how do you tease this out? How do you, you know, really, uh, say, you know, to maybe, I don't know if you can, um, for confidentiality reason, go a little bit deeper, but how do you tease out, you know, go from, we need performance management software to all of a sudden, no, actually it's communication right yeah yeah so you know I did a survey back in late 2018 early 19 on the use of design thinking um, and how it impacted employee engagement and if you're familiar with it the concept of design thinking is is really around you know a systematic method for evaluating the processes and thinking always with the end user the end customer in mind and whether the customer is truly your clients your customers or your employees um, getting them involved in those processes and um, um, so in that particular example um, I gave, uh, a, again, the organization uh, put together um, a series of work groups from a very diverse group of, of customers. This happened to be a hotel organization. So um, while they had hotels across the globe, um, there were different um, types of hotels, different types of workers in the hotels, et cetera. So convening those work groups, um, talking through the processes and the challenges that those employees had, kind of diagramming and outlining some of the possible solutions or new ways that they would like to see things work. And then, you know, iterating on those ideas. Um, <clears throat> oftentimes, design thinking will involve uh, even implementing a technology and then continuing to iterate. But before you even make that that purchase, um, designing the new process and the and and how the technology would support that process, and then working through is that really going to solve the problem? Is that really going to address the challenges that we have? Why did we come to the table with the idea that we needed performance review because communication um, was challenged but digging deeper and through those iterative processes they found no the most impactful thing for their business was the team to team collaboration and how could they you know improve that and, and understand what was going on okay <laughs> Phil do you have a similar example from the, the recruitment side where people are like hey we just need an employer branding ad we need a video that's what we'll do we'll do video um ads and, and everything will be fine or, you know we'll go from 30 applicants per position to 500. there you go uh, you know any uh examples in that area yeah i mean i think the the employer branding video is an, an amazing example actually um even though i i think you just got lucky with that one but it, it's a good sort of starting point i've seen a lot of companies are, are sort of like, hey, we need to do employer branding because I saw it at a conference and what's a good way to do employer branding? Let's do one of these culture videos. And I think there's like a, a similar problem that one of that articulated around, maybe you're not gonna get fired, but like it's not gonna be a good thing if you spend 15,000 bucks and six months on like some video that's very generic that came from the mouths of your marketers and, and just like doesn't give people sort of the, the heart um, just doesn't pull on people's heartstrings, right? Or, or have that humor element. So I think like that's one way that people fall down. I think another is that a lot of people don't actually think through how something's going to impact your um, the results that you care about, your KPIs, and are there ways that we can test this? So for example, I just happen to have a lot of data around how career site videos are actually engaged with. And it's like less than 5% of people that go to your career site actually look at these videos 
and most people don't look at them all the way through. And, and a big part of that is because most of them are terrible. Um, but another is that it just many times doesn't fit with your job seeking behavior. Like you're on mobile, you don't have your headphones in, you're at work, um, you're more going to want to consume content through reading that actually has much higher engagement. And so if I'm a recruiting lead and I'm contemplating like this sort of video thing, a, a better way to do this would to one, be get benchmarking data. But if I can't do that, like put together a sort of a minimum viable product. Um, I like how we're talking about design thinking and now it's sort of like lean startup stuff with recruiting and put that video on your career site and understand the engagement and then think about how that's going to play out in metrics that will impact your cost per hire and time to fill. Um, is this going to increase the conversion rate on our career website? Why do we think that's the case? How are we going to see that play out in our statistics and how do we see that quickly and model it quickly so that we can figure out if this is something worth investing in or not? Um, so maybe, you know, we have this sort of like really easy, quick and dirty career video. We put it on there. We understand our people engaging with it. We look at our conversion rate, what percentage of people that go to our career site are actually applying and how do they flow through our funnel? And if we see that a higher amount of people are converting that then get to phone screens and we can kind of, you know, model that through our full funnel and understand our cost per hire and the implica implication there, we might say, hey, it makes a lot of sense to do a culture video and let's go further than that. Let's do one for each of the core talent demographics we're going after. Let's do one for, you know, engineers and salespeople and people in Vancouver versus Boston versus whatever. Um, but um, I, I don't know if that sort of like rigor is put into stuff. I think most people are kind of going with their gut, shooting from the hip. And that's where you get into these issues where you buy the, the wrong thing for the problem you're actually trying to address. Exactly. Thank you for that. So, you know, we've got through the first step, right? So we've talked about in terms of, pro, uh, you, you know, problem identification. And, and Phil, you had a good point there, right? Because, you know, you're just doing employee branding. Are you just doing a video? Are you just buying an ETS? Are you just doing something, right? Versus you said something really interesting, right? Will this appeal to the core demographic you are attempting to reach, right? There's the problem. We have a DNI initiative and we'd like more of these people. Well, then create content, create a messaging that resonates with those people, right? There's the problem that you have. So excellent, excellent example. Okay, so on to the next piece, right? Let's just say everybody you know on the call today has listened to you and they said, okay, they, they, they've dug down deep, they understand, they've looked at the data, they've identified, they believe they've identified the problem. Maybe they've created a hypothesis, right? Because they've listened to you and, and, and they're more aware now. And um, so, you know, this has happened to me a couple of times, right? So learn my lesson, okay, just don't take it at face value. I was pretty excited. I had C-level on board, even though it was shiny new object, I thought, hey, I'll run with that, right? Because I'll have their support. Well, of course, shiny new object applies to this situation as well. So, all right, so I learned my lesson. I've done my work. I said, okay, this is the problem it'll solve. Um, these are the outcomes we, we get. One of the best ways to reach those outcomes is the use of technology. Great. So I was like, this is a no brainer. And then what happens, right? You talk to a couple of tech companies, no pro or we used to play the absolutely game. This, will you be able to do this, this, and this? Absolutely, right? So we used to take off how many times the consultants or the salespeople would say absolutely to you. So you get in there and say, oh, these guys have got it. They're going to run the project. They're going to do everything. I'm just going to sit back, relax, and let them implement this technology. Those problems that I have identified and the outcomes I'd like to get will happen magically because these folks are just, you know, they're the experts, they do this 800 times a year with all their clients, I'll just leave it to them. Yeah, that didn't work out for me either. Um, so I'm gonna turn it back over to the panel. So how do you take back control, right? You've identified the problem, you, you, you know what outcomes you'd like to get to, how do you then structure the discovery and planning stage, right? So before you do like I did and just run like a bull, right? I was like, yeah, I got the problem. I got the outcomes. How do you make sure that this is structured, right? So it's not, uh, you know, analysis paralysis, but a thoughtful structuring, right? To set you up for success. So I'll hand it over. Who would like to go first? I'll take a stab at it. And I think uh, this will be interesting because Yvette, I feel like you'll be more coming at this from like an enterprise perspective. Um, whereas for me, it's maybe more like a mid-market, like I'm a 
you know, one person wrecking crew in the HR department, or maybe there's 10 or, or 20 of us at most sort of thing. Um, and, and I think for me, there, there's basically like two main things that I like to do when I go on one of these journeys. And one is to think pretty deeply about the business case. So how is this going to impact the stuff that the C-level cares about, that the CFO cares about? Um, it's gonna you know, decrease time to fill. Okay, how is that gonna happen? And how is that going to translate into dollars and cents so that I can brag about it in the future? Um, get more credibility, get more resources that I can then translate into more initiatives that I feel passionately about. Um, but also, how do I think about the key assumptions that have to happen in order for that to actually, you know, become a reality? So it's sort of like modeling that out in Excel, like building a financial model um, and thinking about those those key things. The other, and, and so that's going to give you a set of criteria that um, matter when you're choosing vendors. The other uh, way to do that is think about your implementation process, why you're doing this in the first place, sort of this design thinking mentality, and then translate that into a, another spreadsheet that basically has the vendors you're looking at, and then your key criteria, your must-haves, and then your nice-to-haves, and then a couple of things that I like to look at, like your rep likability. Um, I think that salespeople, like great salespeople can work anywhere. They choose to work at a given company because it allows them to hit quota because the company's got a great product. And so if you've got a great sales rep, that says a lot about the company. Um, I also, of course, look at the business model um, and, and how is this company gonna try to monetize me in the future? Um, because if their you know, business model doesn't align with how our organization is gonna evolve, I can be, end up paying double in two or three years and, and that's a bad situation. Um, and, and just being pretty uh, rigorous when you're thinking about this at the get-go and then as you go through the process and start to collect data on different vendors um, so that you can go back and, and your brain's not like, was that, you know, bamboo or was that namely or, you know what I mean? Like, um, so yeah, th those are sort of my core tactics. Yeah, those are, um, those are, are, are certainly key. We can't underestimate the data gathering piece, right? We assume that in phase one, you've identified the problem and gathered the data, but I actually find that data um, gathering continues um, just beyond the problem definition, getting into the details of, um, you know, the, the real costs, the real, um, the real losses and risk to the organization as a result of that problem. Um, I, I think that piece is oftentimes um, done at a certain level uh, where you can support uh, that, yes, we've got a problem in this area, but not oftentimes gone deeply enough to tie it back to, um, you know, again, the, the cost of risk to the organization, financial implications, um, the cost of, uh, you know, lack of employee engagement, et cetera. So I, I don't want to minimize that data ga gathering piece. It's, it's really huge in this phase two um, step. Another piece, and, and Phil, you mentioned that I might take an enterprise um, play, maybe so, because my, my second point is, how will this solution, this technology that you're considering play with everything else in your enterprise ecosystem? Um, it's common for organizations today to have anywhere between seven to 15 different systems. Heck, even in the recruiting space, right? You've got eight to 12 different technologies that you're using just to support the comprehensive profile of what it means to attract and identify and bring new talent into the organization. And so any technology that you bring in um, you really got to focus on how is that going to work within your ecosystem? Um, you're looking at it for a, a bespoke pur purpose. How is it going to meet that particular problem that you've identified? Um, does it play well with the other technologies in the system? Um, is, it, um, is it readily upgradable? Is, can it be connected into other systems? Um, uh, you know, is the experience um, consistent with um, the other technologies you have, which may be bad or good. Um, sometimes it's great to bring in an entirely new uh, type of user experience um, for individuals, but is your culture ready for that? So again, that comes back to the cost, bringing in new technologies, depending on the type of experience that that technology brings, um, can, can uh, impact uh, costs in some very hidden ways. Uh, the organizational readiness for that, um, the support uh, from, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, executives on down and change management that has to happen. So there's there's a, a lot that goes into that. And I always think about it's like adding a, a new member to your family. Are they going to play well with others? Um, or do they do they fit your family? You know, whether a pet, I guess not not I'm not talking kids. I'm talking pets. Um, <laughs> how well does it fit into your your culture and your organization? Um, and then I guess ultimately, as you're thinking about that technology, um, there are literally thousands of tech vendors in the market. And somehow you've got to find a way to scope that down from thousands to hundreds to 10 to the few that you're going to be looking at. I know we're going to be talking in a bit about some of the, um, the, the detailed vendor selection criteria, but I'm going to say you know, at the very start of this process, I do hope that people take a look at the technology they have as a starting point. From my experience, both as a consultant and in the technology space for vendors themselves, I am constantly surprised at how many organizations don't realize all the technology capabilities of their current vendor stack. Um, they'll go out to bid, um, they'll be evaluating and spending time looking at all those different sites on, um, you know, uh, uh, vendor vendor comparisons, etc., only to find out maybe maybe far into the process that their own vendor had this, this solution. It may not have met their needs, um, maybe it was uh, not quite uh, aligned to their business requirements, but the lack of knowledge of what's even in your pocket today is shameful, but it happens again and again. So make sure that you're staying up to date and anytime you're thinking about a new investment, see what's available. And you know, it's not always just available directly from your technology vendor. Many of these organizations have broad ecosystems, the platform as a service has enabled um, solution extensions and apps that are built on the technology platform your vendor. And so while vendor XYZ may not deliver it in their solution, their partner may have built a, a perfect solution that you're looking for on that technology stack. So there's a lot of ways to start thinking about the vendors you're going to start evaluating. Please start with what you have as, you know, as, as a first step. Wow, that's a great point there. And, you know, to, to say that, you know, in tech companies I've been involved with, even if they don't have a partner or hasn't been involved, there may be some scum courts project or some underlying project and client puts up their hand and said, have you guys thought about this? Actually, we have. We're looking for a partner to test it. Really, it's ready to go. You know, and it's one of those things where, you know, from a customer point of uh, from you know, a, a tech point of view, we just that you know made that customer extremely happy, and of course, some developers very happy because their work got to see the light of day. Yeah, you know, Robert, I'm looking at the chat, and somebody, uh, Martin, um, in Mallorca, Spain, uh, just made a comment about looking at adjacent technologies, and he's absolutely right. Um, you know, we think HCM, we think we have to go to the HCM vendors, but I think we've seen with the evolution of Slack and other collaborative, you know, team type applications, solutions outside of our space are oftentimes a, a, a perfect fit, not just for what we need today, but for where we're going to go. So it's a great point, Martin. I'm glad you you, you mentioned that in the chat. Um, don't be afraid to look into, um, you know, IT tools and financial tools and consumer-based tools, etc., cetera, um, because there's, there's many solutions outside of the core HCM vendor stack that can be really, really value-add for the organization for the, the problems you're trying to address. Yeah, excellent point. So, you know, here we are, we're continuing our journey, right? So, you know, my tales of woe continue. So here we go. I've learned my lesson now. So I go ahead, identify the problem. Uh, I, I get everything together. I take an evidence-based approach, right? So I look at the data, I look at the academic research. Um, I talk to the stakeholders. I look at what we currently have. I see what's available on the market. I narrow it down a little bit. And then I go to the board of the C-suite and say, look at me. Okay, I've learned my lesson. I've grown. Here we go. This is so glaringly obvious. You will all stand up and cheer, pat me on the back, give me a big budget, and off we go. And, uh, and Phil raised this in the beginning. Until I got my MBA, I didn't get too many approvals uh, from that because of the, my glaringly obvious mindset. I did all this work. I identified the problem. I identified the ecosystem, I identified the value, I identified the outcome, but that last business case pitch deck piece, you know, it was a little bit like this is obvious to me. 
So, you know, you know, Phil, you alluded to this before. You mentioned this a few times, right? The business outcomes, you know, understanding ROI and, and moving the needle that way. You yourself, you know, uh, you know, getting an MBA and understanding, you know, how to calculate that. So, you know, walk me through how, you know, short of like what you and I have to do and get an MBA, right, in order to speak the finance language. What could people do to improve the chance, right? You've done all your hard work. You've identified the problem. You, you've you know, you've chosen the right vendors, generally speaking, within, you know, group of 10, you minimized it. And then, you know, you present it and say, okay, let us go forward with this. This is how it is. How do you do that? How do you get to the next level? Yeah, so, oh, I apologize for that, guys. Um, so I, I think this is something that everybody can get better at. And, for some people, it's sort of like innately, like how they, they sort of think about stuff. Um, and for others, they, they go off and get their MBA or, or whatever the case may be. Um, basically, like the way I like to think about this stuff is you have this cold hearted CFO that cares about nothing except for the income statement. Pointing at an employer branding culture video and saying, now that's an ROI. We, you know, we're sharing our culture. That's an ROI. That's not an ROI. That is just like a video <laughs> and you might love that video and candidates might love that video and it and it's doing a great job. People are buzzing about it, but like that's not the ROI. The ROI is that this video impacted your hiring funnel and allowed you to get more inbound high quality applicants that decreased your cost per hire because you're able to slash your agency budget. Um, or this video, helped you convert people faster, which decreased your time to fill, which means those 100 salespeople started a quarter earlier and they were able to generate a quarter more revenue, which translates to $10 million and $2 million of EBITDA and your business is valued at 20 million or 20 times EBITDA, so it's 40 million bucks. Like that, that is like this sort of calculus behind this stuff. It's like very like numbers and at the end of it, it's always a dollar figure. Um, there's always a dollar figure at the end of it. And so my advice is to start sort of boning up on this stuff, like start, you know, um, maybe take an online class or, or whatever the case may be. But in the short term, you've got to find an ally in the company who speaks the language who can help you translate this stuff because you're not going to learn it overnight. Like if you're, especially if you're, you know, mid career or something like that, like you're not going to wake up tomorrow and be like, Oh yeah, that's what I was missing this whole time. Let me just, you know, finish the calculation. Um, it's probably going to be something like you're good at a lot of other stuff and this is something that's a weakness and that's totally fine. Start to address that weakness through personal growth. But in the meantime, bridge the gap by finding an ally who can help you to take what you're doing and just translate it into that math equation that ends with, and that's why we're going to save X, Y, Z amount of money. And my final point here is that I, I think it's really important to get the budget. Um, but what's really cool is that like six, 18, 24 months into a project, you can go back to your initial analysis and you can say, oh, we were so wrong, right? <laughs> like we, we thought the conversion rate would increase by three percentage points and it only increased by two and a half or there's like all this stuff that you learn about yourself. It's almost like this model, this is going to sound really weird, but it's almost like a journal entry of like what you think is going to happen in the future. It's your prediction. And if you've ever read a journal entry that you've written even like six months ago, you're like, what was I thinking? You know, and stuff, some stuff you're going to be pleasantly surprised by and some stuff you're going to be negatively surprised by. But at the end of the day, you're just going to learn about yourself and just become a better manager. I, I love that comment, Phil. You know, um, <clears throat> for years I've watched uh, HR leaders present their business case for whatever investment, whether it was technology or new programs, et cetera. And, <clears throat> excuse me, when uh, an error was found, there was a lot of consternation and, oh, I, I should have known that. How could I have been so wrong, et cetera. And yet you never see that from the CFO side. There is no issue in the accounting world to restate your financials, right? You've, you've done something wrong. You simply restate it and you move on. Why can't we have that mindset in the, in the HR space? Um, so I, I love that, that comment um, as we're building that business case, 
yes, we have to partner with um, with somebody who's really strong, whether it's CFO or somebody who can help um, HR translate, you know, their findings into the language that is um, understood and, and appreciated and accepted by the CFO, the CEO, because honestly, um, that's not typically a core strength of, of many HR leaders, although I'm finding more and more are coming from uh, a financials background. Um, <clears throat> Uh, and and again, you know, it, it, depending on how long that use case, that business case um, review uh, takes, you know, and as you're asked to go back and refine it, maybe you will change some assumptions, and that's okay, right? That doesn't have to be a failure. It's it's a learning opportunity. Um, <clears throat> as far as uh, finding. Um, uh, support in addition to the support that will help you articulate it in a in a MBA level um, approach. Um, I also find that doing some some <clears throat> back office uh, networking, right? Find have conversations with the decision makers of this business case. Understand who's a detractor potentially, and spend time in advance of that presentation bringing them on board. And maybe you can't do it directly, but if you can get to people on their team, people who are supportive, or somebody, I always love bringing in uh, the the person in the organization who's very negative and getting them on board with your approach to help make the pitch. Right to demonstrate that at different levels and even from the classically um, uh, mistrustful individual in the organization who says, you know, I don't think this is this is going to be a good idea. If you can get those detractors in support of your business case, vocally uh, uh, supporting it, um, adding their comments, um, uh, really working the networking effect prior to making the pitch, that's really helpful as well. Um, you know, we talk about the business case in terms of, of money, and of course, it, it does come down to, is this going to save money for the organization or help us, you know, improve our, our, our revenues or profitability? Um, and in that, in that evaluation, don't forget the element of risk, right? There's a lot of risk in the business, and your technology um, can alleviate a lot of that risk. Um, the risk of not being agile enough. <clears throat> What's the opportunity cost when you're not able to bring the right people into the organization or to even identify the talent that you have in the organization so that you can focus on upskilling and redeployment as opposed to having to spend the time to and the cost to hire people. So when you're doing your evaluation in your business case, focus on the, the risk element, how you're reducing compliance risk potentially, and there is a hard dollar cost with every compliance violation, and that should be brought into the, the use case. That cost of, um, again, the loss of, um, of agility for the organization. Um, you know, with the growth of artificial intelligence, we're finding our, our technology tools are enabling much better decision processes. We're getting to decisions better. We're getting to decisions with a greater um, uh, support of more and more data. Uh, the artificial intelligence is now becoming predictive and helping guide us to decisions. Uh, they're identifying risks before they happen. Um, and so again, uh, the the cost of bad decisions or slow decisions um, are are sometimes challenging to to quantify, but that would be part of the analysis I would do in in creating that business case. Um, so you know, again, getting with the right people, uh, doing that networking, evaluating um, the cost and the risk factors of the business case, and then articulating it all with the support of um, of you know financial um, supporters in the organization. If that's not your forte, I think all very important. Oh, Bob, we lost your audio. Bob, we need your audio. There we go. Sorry about that. So. Now that we've gone through that area, right? So, you know, we've gone through, uh, we get the business case approved, generally speaking, right? So this is the problem we're solving. This is how it will impact the organization. We've built our coalition. This is involved. The potential users, we've already spoken to them. Everybody's on board. Okay, cool. So instead of like Phil says, you know, we've taken thousands, narrowed it down to 10 generally. And then now we've got to narrow it down to two or three, right? So your proverbial procurement three. Um, so you, you get it that those you know three individuals. But come on, I mean, you know, I've been I've sat through hundreds of these demos, and you know, to be fair, you, you know, it's like Phil. I shared a little bright shiny object excitement. 
it just looks all so great, you know? And especially if you do them one after another, right? It's like you're just overwhelmed, right? This is amazing and go through this. So how do you, if you've done all that work so far, right? You've got the organizational buy-in, you've gotten the data and so on. So there's a question at the side, Besides, so okay, number one, how do you evaluate, effectively evaluate the vendors, right? Without getting into details of RFPs, but whatever. And then there's a question on the side, which is, okay, how do you validate a lot of the data, right, that they're giving you? We claim this, we allege this, um, we're better than this, and so on. So can you kind of walk us through, you know, the somewhat final step, right, and, and finally choosing that vendor? You've done all your homework, but how do you, really get at it and, you know, throw it out there. Are references any good, right? Because there's now a pushback, you know, in terms of the hiring process, references are just not adding any value. That's what the academic research is showing. And you got some other people say, yes, they do, right? So there's a little bit of debate there. Is there that kind of debate when you're choosing technology, say? So I'm going to hand it over to the experts and let them, you know, um, enlighten us in these areas. And that was lost your audio. Let's see, how about now? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> you said uh, without going into the details of the RFP, but of course there's going to be the standard evaluation of you know the functionality, but, but to your point, Bob, uh, it, it's kind of a leapfrog, right? I mean, they're all, um, you know, it, there's a lot of consistency in the solution. Some are better here or there. Um, there's some major differences in the level of artificial intelligence that's being deployed. Um, if you're an international, multinational organization, the support for international capability and do they have in-country support? I mean, there's some some core elements there. But you know, um, so you can go through that RFP process, but I actually think that references do matter. But the, the question is, from, from whence are those references being sourced, right? Your vendor uh, is going to give you their three, five references who were handpicked. And from my own experience, I've seen uh, customers give a good reference and then I talk to them later and they say listen you know we're terribly unhappy in these five areas and we've been unhappy and we're thinking about replacing you but I'll keep giving you good references because you know I, I, I like that I get to speak at your conference and you treat me really special so so the references from vendors are definitely highly suspect um, I love that you can get to real meaningful feedback throughout our social media there are so many groups out on LinkedIn and Facebook and and other channels where you know groups have started and the conversations are frightfully transparent open and honest and getting into those and now now granted you know a, a lot of that kind of social media um, the most activity is going to be on the negative side because people don't take the time out of their busy busy day to say oh my gosh I love my software I just want to write about it and let people know but they will take the time to write how much they hate it how this this particular area is horrible um, so there is a, a bias towards the negative but it does start the conversation and it it does give you inroads to talk with people from different organizations who have used that their current customers or they've uh, switched from another you know they switch from vendor A to vendor B you know why what was the story with A and 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 how good is B etc so it's so the references I think are, are really important the other thing I really think is important is the partner ecosystem um, does the technology vendor implement their own software or do they use sim system implementers? If they're using system implementers, really look at um, you know, the quality of those, those implementation partners. What's the turnover rate for um, the consultants in their organization? And how does the vendor train uh, those, those um, individuals? Is it you know, if I if I take a couple of classes on an HCM suite, am I really qualified to implement a very complex um, solution in recruiting, as well as payroll, as well as performance, as well as compensation? Um, so, so the the partner ecosystem is is really important. And as I mentioned earlier, before it's not just the implementation partners, but it's the additional software capabilities, the additional apps and services that that ecosystem can also bring to the table. You might be looking to buy software, say, in uh, talent management, and as you evaluate a vendor, you see that they've also got an ecosystem that's really around well-being and compensation and things that are going to help accelerate your business. So evaluating the partner ecosystem, I think, is an, an, a very important part of this, uh, um, this uh, vendor selection. Phil, I'll put it over to you. Yeah, um, pretty pretty good answer there. Um, I'll try to add some stuff. I, I think 
a generalizable lesson is to always understand the bias of the person that you're getting information from. So these online groups are great. As Yvette points out, a lot of people are negatively biased and, and a lot of, and those are the people who like to be heard and go on social media and, and talk. Um, I think also like a lot of people, they have like bad experiences with like one account rep or something. And they're like, oh, this, this system's garbage or they used it incorrectly or, or whatever. Um, or they had a great experience and they love this one little module. Um, and so it, it's really hard to sort of like extract the bias from a lot of this stuff. And a lot of these people honestly are essentially bribed, right? They're, it's like, hey, come speak at our user conference. We'll put you up in this suite, blah, blah, blah. Let's play some golf. Let's, you know, I'll send you an away suitcase, all this stuff. Like that's in my opinion called bribery. It's legal, um, it happens, but I would just be like, like be aware of that. What's also interesting is that, um, and this is a big reason why I started my business. If you go on a lot of these review websites, most of the reviews are like five stars um, for like, look up the worst software that you know, type in that reviews right now into Google and you will find on most of these websites, it has a four and a half to five star rating. Uh, and that's because all of those people are paid to write those reviews. Um, and again, it's not bribery for whatever reason. Um, and so, it's really challenging. Like Martin, your, your question earlier, how do you know what data is real and what's not? I always think about this from an investing perspective. Um, cause that's sort of where I cut my teeth, um, talking to companies and, and figuring out, do I want to invest in this company? Do I want to put 10% of my net worth into this one business? And what are the questions I need to drill down on? Uh, and I think that's what you got to do. You got to drill down hardcore. Why, 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 where, 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 a great example, talked to a vendor uh, a couple weeks ago and they are essentially a next generation job board. They call themselves something much different, um, but they're basically a job board and their whole differentiator is that they have the best quality talent. Okay, what does the best quality talent mean? Oh, that means like our people get hired the best. Oh, okay, what does that mean? How, how do you know that? Oh, we got that data from uh, this ATS. Oh, okay, like what was the specific data and after like seven or eight questions, it became clear, and this is with the head of sales for this company, um, that somebody one time maybe in a meeting from an ATS said, oh yeah, you guys have really good quality applicants. And that's the first slide deck in their pitch. Mm. And this is like, this is a company that undoubtedly many people in this chat uh, are customers of. Now that said, um, we, did a back, we did three backdoor references and everybody was really happy. And so we ended up buying the solution and it's actually a good solution to be a customer of. Um, and so that's like what makes this stuff so hard is that if you just drill down or you play that absolutely like drinking game, I think that's hilarious um, to just ask like random questions. Like, could it do this? Oh, absolutely, don't worry about it. Um, but so you can do that and you can have a really negative impression, but it can actually be a good solution for the goals that you're trying to get at. And so you need to have all these disparate signals to eventually build yourself a holistic understanding of this business. Um, Yvette, the, the last thing that I'll just reiterate that you said was around employee attrition. Um, I am doing investing again in private software businesses. And what I've found is that the attrition, especially of engineering and salespeople is an incredibly high signal to whether or not a company is doing well. And so most people here have LinkedIn, you might have a license to LinkedIn talent insights. You can look at the attrition for a company in the engineering and sales teams. And if they have high attrition for sales, that means they can't sell the product. That means all those good salespeople are going to other products and you, you probably don't want to be a customer there. That's a, that's such a, a great, great point. Um, looking at, uh, looking at that turnover, you know, I was thinking that, you know, a lot of people look at, oh, who's got the, who are the top 100 vendors with the best culture? And that is a, a, a direction, you know, to consider. It's a data point. But I also know a lot of those scores come from just dialing, you know, getting getting friends and family to call in and, and vote with a phone call. And it's not necessarily um, always based on, um, you know, a, a, a more diligent uh, assessment. So um, I, I love that idea of the, the attrition. You know, um, I had to jump in, uh, Bob, when, and just add one other piece. Um, in these conversations and gathering the data, 
uh, the constant, um, you know, drill down into to getting deeper and deeper levels of understanding um, is key. And the area that I think a lot of people maybe don't focus on enough is the vendor client relationship. Um, what does it really feel like to be a customer? Is the support there? Is your is your sales um, um, and customer account manager keeping you up to date on what the product has, or are you like those customers I referenced at the start of the call? You don't even know what the what the latest capabilities are you don't know all the options available to you um, you know how how easy to consume are the the updates in the software how frequently are they coming do they engage you in um, early um, early adopter or design programs etc that whole vendor customer relationship um, is is almost as important as the functionality itself. You can have great functionality, but if the relationship, if the support, if that is failing, you won't be able to tolerate uh, using that software. So, so make sure you put enough focus in that area as well. Oh, we lost you, Bob. So we're on the home stretch now. Uh, we've been given our 10 minute warning about five minutes ago. And so, you know, as promised, you know, because we are hacking HR, we believe in, you know, giving people some nuggets of wisdom that they could walk away with, some hacks. So if I was going to put you on the spot and say, what are your top one to three hacks that you would like people to put in place, you know, before the end of this week, what top one to three pieces of advice would you have for uh, the audience today? I think real quick, uh, the stuff that you uncover, if you ask these why, why, why questions and get bad answers, you can translate that into negotiating leverage. So the, the company I just referenced, we got 30% off the price because we were like, you guys told us this thing, which is total bullshit, and it's the first slide in your slide deck. Like, what's up with that? Um, so that's that's a really good hack. Number two, when you sign up to get a demo of a company, they email you and they're like, hey, let's talk. And then they spend an hour asking you questions. That's all discovery call. They just want to know, do you have BANT? Do you have budget, authority, need, and timeline? And so what I do when I get those emails is I say, hey, sales development rep, I have BANT. I've got the budget, authority, need, timeline. Let's just do the demo. And I save myself a lot of time and aggravation. Um, the, the last pro tip I have is just go to select software reviews and, and use the research that we're doing all day long to like vet these vendors and build ROI calculators. And this stuff is designed to just like help people do a better job and it's all free. I love it. I, I love those uh, the hacks and and just saying it when you answer the phone, um, you know, yes, I've got the budget authority, et cetera. Just give me the demo. I love that. Um, you know, this isn't really I, I don't know if you'd call it a hack, but again, I'm finding that, you know, less than um, less than 25 percent of organizations that I've surveyed involve employees um, to a you know a high level in their um, their experience and their their technology investment um, they make decisions that they need to get technology and then they move forward so that the number one um, kind of my key and only recommendation is to make sure you're engaging and involving your workforce from the problem definition stage all the way through and post implementation. Um, you're not done when you implement and go live. That's actually just the beginning. You think the beginning of the journey is problem identification, but no, it's implementation and go live. And you need to keep that engagement with that, um, that, that, that uh, employee base. So design thinking um, as you're thinking about digital transformation or any investment, if you're not engaging to a high degree, um, a, a, a good uh, set of uh, cross-functional uh, people from across your organization, um, I really don't think you're going to be able to meet your needs um, and get the adoption and the success from your investment uh, that you're looking for. And that's kind of my one and only hack. Uh, keep people involved from, from start through continued, continued engagement. All right. Well, fantastic. Well, I'd like to once again thank our two panelists, so Phil and Yvette, uh, for guiding us through this journey in terms of how to buy HR tech software. Um, I think, you know, I put you on the spot, you know, for your final hacks, but, you, you know, I've got pages of information still um, in terms of, you, you know, nuggets of wisdom that you're able to share. 
So I appreciate it, and I'm sure you know the, the folks on the call really appreciate it as well. And so just a, one last piece, we've got a minute. So if you want, uh, just one last pitch, if you want uh, people to connect with you and so on, uh, you've, you've got about a minute. Yeah, so uh, if you'd like to connect uh, with me, um, I'm at y at nextgeninsights.net. Um, I'm also on LinkedIn, and uh, again, would love to talk to anybody about trends and buying HR software. And uh, if you're thinking about the future and uh, personal identity and you know how we take our profiles forward and what that's going to mean for rethinking how we buy software in the future and how HR technology providers issue software when it's individual centric and individual owned, this is a good conversation to have with me. Great. Yeah, thanks everybody. I dropped my LinkedIn into the, the sidebar, so feel free to connect and uh, look forward to continuing the conversation offline. Thank you, and, and thanks Bob and Yvette, it was a lot of fun. All right, guys. great stuff, thank you. and. Go forth in HR. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good yeah. luck, everybody.